This program on spirituality, bullying, and freedom is copyright 2019 by Richard A. Matheson. It was presented by him on May 26, 2019 to the Breakfast Forum of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Lehigh Valley. Welcome. Welcome to Spirituality, Bullying, and Freedom. And yes, this will be absolutely fascinating. <laughs> if you don't come up and try to lynch me or something. But uh, <laughs> and, uh, that's me, and that's the forum. And my subject is religious freedom, an outstanding achievement of Western civilization. But it is recent, geographically limited to the West, and fragile and that means under attack. So, in 1786, Thomas Jefferson uh, passed the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, really the first uh, major statute. In 1787 was the U.S. Constitution and its Bill of Rights in 89. And in 1789, there was the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which included religious freedom. Uh, that's his part of the French Revolution. And religious freedom today is about spirituality, not religion. And I'm going to raise and try to answer the question, why might attitudes about spirituality lead to bullying? And I'm going to talk about the rise of modern science and its relationship to religious freedom, about the physical sciences versus the social sciences, and then finally about religious freedom today, which I describe as seeking spirituality in a secular age. So my structure is going to be four main topics. This is the introduction. Religious freedom historically, the rise of modern science, meaning physical science, the rise of modern science, the social sciences, and then finally, religious freedom today, seeking spirituality in a secular age. That's where I'm going. Warning. I intend to raise deep and perplexing questions to which I will not offer answers. And I especially will not try to prefer religious answers over secular answers. Because since most of you know I'm a pastor, a retired Lutheran pastor, you might think I had some bias. I tried to give you religious preferences. But my goal is to offer a framework for thinking about the subject, thinking about the subject of spirituality, bullying, and freedom. So let's get started. A, <clears throat> section one is religious freedom historically. And a noted scholar of world religion says there are seven world religions, or I'm going to call them seven attitudes about spirituality. And five of them are perfectly obvious, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And those are all religions that in their past uh, have had incidents of bullying, in many cases, many incidents of bullying in the past. And the result of that is that when we talk about religious freedom historically, we're talking usually in the past about freedom from religious bullying. But the seven uh, attitudes, I call them pro-spirituality attitudes. I just added that there. And you can see there's two other attitudes that are not usually <laughs> considered religions. And number six is Marxism, by which I mean communism. And 
Karl Marx called spirituality the opiate of the people. He advocated dialectical materialism. Materialism mean, meaning not spiritual. Violent overthrow of the government he considered necessary. And he referred to his attitude as, quote, scientific, unquote, although that would be questioned by some. But if I were asked to describe what he meant by spirituality as the opiate of the people, I would say he thought people were being kept dumb and happy while capitalists oppressed them. That's my interpretation of what he meant. Some people are not in agreement. Okay. <laughs> and Vladimir Lenin uh, brought the Bolshevik Revolution to Russia, and Joseph Stalin, who was the communist leader of Russia and the Soviet Union, led an atheist five-year plan in 1932 to 37, which included shooting over 50,000 Russian Orthodox priests. Now, that's something I would call bullying. <laughs> and the communists, like other attitudes about spirituality, had good intentions, or so I would claim, for the sake of this lecture. They sought equality for all people, especially the workers, who were the oppressed proletariat. But religious freedom, and I, as I see it, includes freedom from secularist <laughs> bullying as well as freedom from religious bullying. So on these four main topics, you'll see number one, I've added religious freedom historically, freedom from religious bullying, and freedom from secularist bullying. That's sort of a different twist that people may not think of. And then there's a seventh religion or a seventh <coughs> attitude towards uh, <coughs> spirituality, and this is Wilfred Cantwell Smith. He's from Harvard University. He was the director of Harvard's Center for the Study of World Religions from 1964 to 72, and then again, uh, professor of comparative religions there from 78 to 84. He took five years off to write a book on faith versus belief because he thinks they're entirely different and they're confused with each other. And he's the one that I am following in the seven world religions or seven attitudes. <clears throat> the seventh one is what he calls Western secularism. And this is an attitude about spirituality, but it is a skeptical attitude. As you can see, the ones on the right column are listed as either anti-spirituality, Marxism, or skeptical. And Western, yeah? Could you call that humanism? Could I what? Could you call Western yeah, secularism? Yeah, well, in fact, humanism? if you look underneath it, you'll see that Good. Professor Cantwell uh, talks about this really being the French Enlightenment. Enlightenment but he traces its roots back to what he calls Greek, humanism, Greek rationalism, humanism, idealism. So he sees what appeared really for the first time at the time of the French Revolution, or the philosophs in France, uh, and of course Jefferson in the US. But uh, it has roots way back to uh, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks. So those are the seven we'll be looking at, and you see that the five on the left are the pro-spirituality, because they're religions, and the two on the right are either negative or skeptical about spirituality. Okay, now I want to put these onto a 5,000-year timeline of civilization. This is something I used when I did uh, a lecture on the Bible for atheists and non-believers this 5,000 years. And you can see that, you see where that black mark is? It starts 3,000 years ago, which is when the pyramids began to be built. And then in Western Civ, we date zero from the birth of Jesus. And then 
2000 <coughs> AD is really just today. So on that timeline, those five religious traditions, Hinduism and Judaism are the two oldest. And Judaism dates back to about 1000 BC, the formation of the state of Israel, and the invention, really, for the first time of the Hebrew alphabetic language. And Hinduism dates back about that far, maybe a little further back. Now, actually, Judaism, we know that the, the 1000 BC we can verify by archaeology, but Judaism claims there was an Exodus event, Moses leading people out in 1200 BC, and traces all the way back to Abraham around 1700 BC. He was considered by Judaism as the father of Judaism. Then we have Buddha, born about 563 BC. And putting Buddha on, you can see where Buddha is in that timeline. And then at zero, of course, is the birth of Jesus. That's the start of Christianity. And about 620, well, at 622, the prophet Muhammad made his trip to Medina, and that's the date <coughs> from which Islam dates its calendar, the 622. Well, just trying to give you a sense, and then I wanted to bring up Jefferson and the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty. And that's 1786, so on our timeline, that's way at the right-hand end. You can see how recent uh, religious liberty is in this sense that I'm using it. And the early statutes, 1786, Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, 87 was the Constitutional Convention, 1789 was the First Amendment, 1789 also the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, which includes religious freedom. And then there is what it looks like on the <coughs> Jefferson is way, uh, the Statute of Religion is really out of the right hand end. So, religious freedom started back in the late 1780s in a mostly religious age back then. And back in 1750 AD or so, nearly all people were religious, and I'm suggesting 95%, but that's a guess, because there's been a steady 3 to 5% of atheists pretty much throughout history. Then we had the Roman Emperor Constantine, called Constantine the Great, and he legalized Christianity at 313 AD. And that's of interest to us because I'm going to just trace quickly the history of Christianity and religious freedom. And basically from zero, which is the birth of Jesus, until about 391, which is when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, there was no bullying that we know of because the Christians had no power. But in 313, uh, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, making Christianity legal. And in 330, he split the Roman Empire into two halves, the eastern half, Greek-speaking, known as the Byzantine Empire, and the western half, Latin-speaking, known as Western civilization. And then in 391, the Emperor Theodosius made Christianity an official religion of the Roman Empire, eventually with substantial bullying, and I think you all know those stories, the Inquisition, the wars of religion, the Crusades, all that kind of stuff. Now, there has also been at least one example of secularist bullying, and this is the French Revolution, the Bastille, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man. This is August 26, 1789. And I'm just going to read two articles. Article 2, the goal of any political association is the conservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, safety, and resistance against oppression. And then Article 10 is the one that deals with religion. No one may be, de may be disturbed for his opinions, even religious ones 
provided their manifestation does not trouble the public order established by law. So <clears throat> the French Revolution did involve what I would consider some bullying. Uh, there was the storming of the Bastille in July 14th. Well, then the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was good. Uh, but a few months later, all church property in France was placed at the disposition of the nation, which means they basically expropriated it and held auctions to auction much of it off. Then the civil constitution of the clergy, where they were then made to swear loyalty to the state of France and not to the Pope, and it was about 50-50, half of them did it and half didn't. And then the ones who didn't were banned from preaching the next year, and later many were arrested and imprisoned, and quite a few of them died. And then beyond that, there was the terror, uh, when a lot of people got executed. And finally, Napoleon Bonaparte stepped in. Anyway, it's just one example. And there's not a lot of examples of that kind of secularist bullying, but it does sort of show that that can happen. So here we're back to the seven world religions, seven attitudes about spirituality the five that are pro-spirituality and the two that are anti or skeptical. And as a summary, many religions have bullied people religiously. Secularist attitudes toward spirituality have sometimes bullied people. Why, and this is the interesting question to me, why is it that attitudes about spirituality with the highest good intentions and often advocating a religion of love, right? Why would they bully people? Or why would attitudes that are secular but with the highest good intentions bully people? And my answer here is called taken for grantedness. Each religion has a whole set of ideas and attitudes that it takes for granted, and it assumes that everybody else should follow suit. And that is uh, what's interesting, and what was interesting about the thing with Constantine is that that taken for grantedness to really result in bullying only occurs when you have control of the state. If you have the state power to enforce, if you're totally voluntary, you don't have any power. So the next thing we're going to look at is taken for grantedness in a scientific context. So just going back, our four main topics, religious freedom historically, freedom from religious bullying and freedom from secularist bullying. The rise of modern science is next, and I'm going to deal with that the rise of modern physical sciences and taken for grantedness. But I figured that I better give you a chance to, if you need clarification on what I'm saying, or if not, I'm happy to keep going. Okay, keep going, one through, yeah. Um, when you say religious bullying, is it religions bullying other people or are the people bullying religion? Yeah, it's religions bullying other people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good question. Uh, I got Carrie and then Fred. Um, I know that taken for granted is a main theme and I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that and if there's a chance, Richard, you could explain maybe in current context uh, is, is society doing some tainted for, tainted for grantedness or, you know, yeah, uh, well, Islamic society believes that everybody should be Islamic and they may tolerate other ones, but you will pay a different set of taxes. Christians, you know, throughout history there's been bullying. And uh, I gave you an example of Judaism. The whole Old Testament is full of the ancient. Israelites bullying the Philistines or the Amalekites or the Moabites or whatever. So 
I'm trying to be generic here because I'm not trying to pick out the the religions and say they're bad. I'm saying everybody gets involved in this. You know, the communists who are so convinced they're right that they have to slaughter the people who are preventing them from getting the job done. It's a threat. Yeah. What is some of the uh, Christian bullying? Because they thought other denominations and other religions would pe would lead their members astray, and then their members would go to hell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, there's lots of good intentions. There's good <laughs> intentions all over the place. I've got the back, and then you. Yeah, there was uh, outright murder in the French Revolution, but was it mostly class based? Like when they stormed the prison, because the uh, uh, cardinals and bishops and priests were often like the second sons of, of uh, the local aristocrats. Yeah. Well, uh, the example I used was Stalin killing more than 50,000 Russian Orthodox priests. Actually, it's quite a bit more than that. But I just wanted to give that's a, that's a clearly religious thing. He's doing that because they're religious, not for any other reason. There's also a lot of killing going on for a whole bunch of reasons. Okay. What do you mean by spirituality? There are a lot of definitions. I don't know where you stand. Okay, I'm being very vague. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, it's a good question. Uh, I mean an attitude that there is something in the world that is worth seeking for. Even if you may feel that it's not there and your answer is it doesn't exist. In other words, an atheist can be a seeker for spirituality. I would call, I would call a Unitarian Universalist seekers for spirituality. I would call the various religions. In other words, I'm going to use, you're getting ahead of me, but I might as well get into this now. I'm going to be dividing those two sets of people, the five on the left and the two on the right, according some, to something I'm going to use the term transcendence. Is there something transcendent, or is human life all there is? So it's a human flourishing, yeah, exclusively human flourishing without anything, without life after death, or without something bigger going on. So I'm intentionally being vague because I'm trying to cover the whole waterfront and give you or help you with a framework for thinking about it, if possible. Yeah, there is a point of view uh, looking at things practically that religion is not about spirituality. In fact, that spirituality is the enemy of religion uh, religion is about order, and as you mentioned, spirituality is about seeking. Frequently seeking is the worst enemy of religion. Well, no, it's a very, uh, it's a very good point, and, and Wilfred Cantwell Smith, the Harvard professor, he spent a lot of time writing a book where he distinguished faith and belief, and he says all of these seven groups have faith in something, but whether they, but they, none of them actually have beliefs. They, especially the religions, he thinks belief is a wrong term. Now that's a whole argument that would take us way too long to try to get into, but yeah, but there really is a difference there and it's a significant one. Okay, rise of modern physical sciences and taken for grantedness. It happens that there is a textbook on taken for grantedness. And it was written by a man named Thomas Q. And it's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. I'm wondering how many of you have ever heard of it? I get uh, maybe about 10%. Okay, good. But uh, uh, he is very famous for this book. And uh, it came out in 1962, and it's about, in my opinion, it's about taken for grantedness, but he's tracing 
the history of modern science, the physical sciences, as a series of battles against this attitude of taken for grantedness, starting with the Copernican Revolution. And, and the Copernican Revolution, and I'm taking this out of order, but is, is everybody until Copernicus, who was 1353 AD, everybody before that thought the Earth was the center of the universe and the sun went around it because it was perfectly obvious, right? You go outside, the Earth's not moving, right? And the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west. Obviously, the sun is going around you, right? That's a taken for grantedness. And Copernicus comes along and says, well, I've done all this study, and we'll talk about what he studied. But he says, the only way I can make the numbers add up, this is about the sightings of the moon and the planets, is if we assume the Earth is moving. And everybody says, no, it can't be, it can't be, it can't be. And, and they go through hell, if I can say it that way. You know, Galileo almost got executed for supporting Copernicus. But it was all about this high idea that, uh, but the Earth, the Earth stands still, and they go around it. And trying to get people to make that mental shift is what Thomas Kuhn calls a paradigm shift. The old Ptolemaic paradigm, going back to Aristotle, and the new Copernican paradigm. Now, you can see there, Thomas Kuhn says the church, that's the Catholic church, from 1000 AD to 1600 AD was quite supportive of science. Uh, that's the high Middle Ages, the, the later Middle Ages, you know, that's Aquinas and scholasticism. Now before 1000 and after 1600, the church was anti-science, which is what we usually hear about. But in that period, the church was uh, pro-science, and in 1545 AD, which is the Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformation to the Protestant Reformation, the church had a calendar problem. It needed help. And the Pope asked the leaders of all Europe to appoint their best astronomers to a committee to study this calendar problem. And one of the people appointed was Copernicus, because he was a highly regarded astronomer. And what we're talking about, today we would call it the replacement of the Julian calendar by the Gregorian calendar. The Julian calendar, that's Julius Caesar, had 365 days in a year rather than the leap year, right? But the Gregorian calendar has, now it's not exactly 365.25, it's 365.2425. I'm, I'm sure you're really interested in this. <laughs> but but every, every uh, year divisible by four, no, every year divisible by 100, you know, like 1900, 2000, the leap year is supposed to drop out. There's no leap year. Mm -hmm. But if it's divisible by 400, like 2000 that most of us lived through, then it, then it comes back in. So it looked like a normal leap year to us, but that was how they get this exactitude, because it was 13 days off in that 1300 years since the uh, Julian, since Julius Caesar. Anyway, that was the problem, and they did solve it. But Copernicus had a bigger problem with astronomy, and you know what it is. Uh, back in the time of Aristotle and before, scientists took for granted the Earth was at the center of the universe. It was obvious, right? But Ptolemy is the definitive statement of that. He was about 150 AD, and the definitive statement is in his book Almagest, and it's called the Ptolemaic Theory, and it describes how all these different planets and Ptolemy considered the sun to be a planet, the moon to be a planet, 
because they're all going around the Earth. And they have to be in these concentric spheres. I'll get that right. Uh, you know, so it was a very uh, uh, difficult, but, but he laid it all out and he said exactly when you'll see this or that. And for the most part, it worked, but it had all these little exceptions in it. And that's what uh, Copernicus was dealing with. So here's Copernicus. And he was well aware of the problems that, with Ptolemy. And he told the Pope, he wrote a book addressed to the Pope called De Revolutionibus, <laughs> the revolutions. And he said, I think the earth moves. And everybody said, oh, OK. They didn't understand the ramifications at the time. Because actually what happened was the Protestants came after them and said, no, that's against the Bible. And then the Catholics had to crack down, and they cracked down on Galileo. Well, anyway, that's a whole long story. I'm interested in some of these silly things. But I'm going to put this back on that timeline, and you can see Aristotle is about 350 years before uh, before Jesus, and Ptolemy is about 150 years after, and Copernicus <coughs> is about 1353. So Copernicus' book became very con controversial and was later banned in 1616. That caused problems for Galileo because he supported it, but that book that Copernicus wrote was used by the astronomers who worked on the Gregorian calendar re uh, reform of 1582. They found Copernicus's book so good that it was better than Ptolemy. Anyway, to Thomas Kuhn, this became a key example of all scientific revolutions. And here's his theory. He's challenging the whole scientific establishment. Because their view of science, and many people still have this view, is science is incremental. You build little by little, you keep adding to it. And Keane said, nope, not at all. He said, the major force of progress is these paradigm shifts, the sudden jumps. And his most important example was the Copernican Revolution, which was a shift from the Ptolemaic paradigm. <coughs> And Kuhn thinks that science, this is hard science, it's always hard science. Science has a paradigm, and they use that for making predictions, and they do what he calls normal science. So they did normal science for more than a thousand years with Ptolemy. But then you start getting anomalies, things that don't add up. And then, as those accumulate, like they did for Copernicus, finally, somebody has to come up with a new theory, and then the whole scientific establishment, which in this case is astronomers, and the astronomers won't let the government tell them, won't let the church tell them. You know, They keep the church out of it, the government out of it, but they eventually decided Copernicus is right, and then we've been learning that ever since. But the new theory, the Copernican theory, could never be come up with by somebody thinking in the way Ptolemy thought. It just doesn't make sense. And that's what he means by a paradigm shift. It's a change that is so complete. Then the next paradigm was Isaac Newton, the laws of motion and universal gravity. And then uh, Antoine Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry and like the uh, table of elements. Albert Einstein and the theory of relativity. Each of these was a paradigm shift when the regular science couldn't answer certain questions. So you have this sense throughout science of people who are stuck in one mode of thinking, the taken for granted mode of thinking, right? And then they have to be gotten out of it. And that's a struggle. Each time it's a struggle. There are people still struggling with relativity. 
Uh, you know, it's, each of these is a big change. So, a summary of the physical sciences. There are always battles over taken for grantedness. And these hard sciences are measuring the real world, so it's self-correcting. If you have a bunch of physical scientists who are wrong, they're going to get their comeuppance. Uh, refuse to accept religious authority or political authority. And the group of the physical scientists in a particular field, they are the highest authority in our modern science. And they can accomplish wonderful things, right? We can send men to the moon, we can go inside the atom, we can create atomic bombs or hydrogen bombs, right? We can do all these things because science has no morals, right? If you want to do uh, uh, spitting more and more pollution into the air or climate change or atomic bombs or intercontinental, you know, science can do it. It doesn't have anything that's stopping it. Anything stopping it has to come from outside of science. And so physical sciences and religion, the church had been, uh, throughout the High Middle Ages, later and the early Renaissance, the church was a supporter of science. Nearly all the scientists were Christians. They saw no conflict of their scientific work with their religion. They didn't attempt to use their work for non-religious purposes. However, their work had ramifications. And other people, especially during the French Enlightenment, found the work of the physical sciences to justify other ideas of spirituality, such as most notably deism uh, or atheism. And the really big change came later with the social sciences. And section three is the rise of modern science in the social sciences. I don't know if I dare take questions on the physical sciences. <laughs> I don't see anybody chopping at the bit. Okay. The rise of the modern. Yeah. Yeah. Just one, I'm wondering why you're not including uh, quantum physics in your. Yeah. Actually, that's one of his examples, <clears throat> and the reason was while while Einstein is very clear with relativity, quantum physics is. Planck and Heisenberg, and you know there was, an, and, and Eisen, uh, <coughs> Einstein himself was involved with that. It was it isn't as clear cut, and I'm trying not to confuse anybody. But yeah, that was that was definitely a paradigm shift. Okay. Okay, the rise of modern science, the social sciences. Here we get controversial. <clears throat> ha ha ha. <laughs> well, for the social sciences, I'm going to pick three social sciences and limit myself to their relationship to spirituality and religion, right? Because that's my topic. Spirituality, bullying, and freedom. <clears throat> and the three are sociology, anthropology, and psychology. All three have a very skeptical relationship to religion, in my experience. I would even call it an antagonistic relationship. And I'm going to start with psychology and Sigmund Freud. And his book on religion is called The Future of an Illusion. OK? So you know what he thinks about religion, right? He's all in favor of it. No, I guess he's not. But uh, anyway, that's his book. In sociology, the two outstanding figures in the study of religion are Max Weber and Emil Durkheim. And there's pictures of them. Uh, Weber is a German, Durkheim is a French sociologist. And <clears throat> Richard Matheson. <laughs> As a sociology major at Rutgers in 1976, <laughs> as a senior, I did an independent study by reading all the works of Max Weber and Emil Durkheim on religion. 
because I was fascinated by religion. And so that's what I spent my senior year at Rutgers in sociology doing. And I believe that Max Weber and Emil Durkheim had an attitude about religion similar to Freud's, the future of an illusion. And as a sociology major, I think it's true of most of the sociology professors I knew and the anthropology professors. Because I, you know that I've done two lectures on human evolution. A very skeptical attitude toward religion. I would call it biased today. But what's most surprising to me, in retrospect, that, that was long before I ever thought about ministry, believe me. But most surprising is I took that skeptical attitude toward religion for granted. It seemed totally normal to me uh, at the time. Now, looking back, you know, I'm sort of saying, how can you be studying religion if you think it's all nonsense? You know, you're trying to explain it in terms of other things rather than saying, well, religion exists and well. Now, some younger sociology professors found it a bit odd. And so they decided the attitude ought to be tested scientifically. And one of the best known is Rodney Stark, whose textbook on sociology has gone through 10 editions. And he's published over 30 books. But Stark was part of a group from Berkeley, of all places, uh, under Charles uh, Glock. Uh, he had a whole bunch of students, and, and he wanted them to measure and test everything. So they're out there measuring and testing, and uh, the book in which Rodney Stark and his uh, helper Roger Fink lay out the evidence is this book from 2000 called Acts of Faith, where they actually trace the development of ideas in sociology from Compte, who was the founder, and Weber and Durkheim. It's full of statistics and analysis. But for example, the standard sociology belief was religion's declining. And the research showed religion around the world is increasing. Uh, actually by a fairly large amount. And that occurs even though in the United States and Western Europe it is declining. You know, it's the increases in Africa and Asia that are the cause of the increase. So, <clears throat> Wilfred Catwell Smith has also written about it in his quote, it is amazing the extent to which we in the West have been maneuvered into thinking about religion in secular terms. It's as if human nature is fundamentally secular and religion is an add-on. To be religious is altogether normal for human beings and it's the secular that is the anomaly. That's his opinion. But then, we have Thomas Kuhn, who approaches this from a different angle. He's not interested in the religion. He sees the physical sciences as being about paradigms, right? With a paradigm shift, like from Ptolemy to Copernicus. And that, de that depends on making predictions. You make predictions and you compare them. But the social sciences can't make predictions because they're dealing with people. And every time you try to predict what people will do, they will always find a way to mess you up. I have some great examples. <clears throat> and the question that interests him is, can social science have a paradigm? And his answer, and at this point, at this there's a big conference on this out in California in 1988. And at this conference, he was arguing with another scholar of, of uh, philosophy, this is all philosophy of science, named Charles Taylor. And Taylor said, no, social sciences are completely different. 
And Kuhn says, well, I'm not sure, but what I do know is they don't yet have a paradigm. You know, in other words, they don't have uh, uh, findings that they can replicate, you know, that they can draw a wall from to test. And that means that they're there without being able to correct themselves if they happen to have a bias. Okay, here we are. Summary of social sci social sciences, and I'm picking out the area where social sciences are maybe vulnerable, but they uh, have much success, but religion is a difficult area for them because Max Weber is famous for wanting social sciences to be value neutral. You know, how can you be value neutral about religion when religion is really about values? A tendency not to accept religion as an independent variable. The group of social sciences is the highest authority, <coughs> but their biases are not automatically self-correctable. And that would bring us to section four on religious liberty today, See, which I call seeking spirituality in a secular age. I'm trying to get away without asking. No, no. If you have questions, this or clarifications or whatever. Yeah. Does the social science have a disadvantage over other sciences because the thing they're studying keeps changing? It keeps changing, yeah. Yeah. So you don't have a solid platform platform on which to do research. Yeah. Yeah, there's really <clears throat> okay. It started with um, what? Uh, paganism and then moved to Hinduism and then so you can see that it's an F Religion, it, it just feeds up on one another and evolves, you see? And then we, we see it as today as, oh, well, it's unchanging, so I'll throw it away. No, it's still evolving, so why not keep evolving? <laughs> okay, but, but, but here's what the question is. The question is, with the hard sciences, yeah. you have a way to measure and test. With the soft sciences, you don't have a way to measure. If I asked anybody here, how can you measure love? You know, do your kids love you? You know, or do your parents love you? Or do you love, or do you love your spouse? You know, it's a very difficult, or, or what's the value of morality? What's the value of freedom? Is anything worth dying for? It, it's a, it's, the social sciences are in a very difficult box but but that's the problem. Yeah. Would you consider Kinsey a social scientist? Is it what? <laughs> Kinsey. Alfred Kinsey. Alfred oh, Kinsey. Now Kinsey was a social scientist. <laughs> They're trying to measure uh, sexuality all you know for years. Uh, yeah. People were measuring brain activity and. Oh yeah, you you can do a lot of things. Kinsey was considered to be pretty biased actually, but <laughs> but you know it's all it's everybody has a bias. And it's hard to do. And your question was, or, or they, can you quantify it or measure it or uh, yeah. make laws about it? I think they, they are trying to do that. They, yeah, they're, they're certainly trying to. Okay. It's just that, that when you're trying to predict what people will do. Well, some of them think they have predicted what people will do. Oh. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll tell you about the Hawthorne uh, effect, if you want. Yeah. yeah. One of the problems, when you talk about religion, you have to define your terms. Yeah. What do you mean by religion? Yeah. And I always hang on the Eric Fromm definition. Religion is an object of devotion and a frame of orientation. Everybody has a religion. Yeah. So, no, I agree. And uh, I'll, I'll give you, because I think I have time, I'll, I'll give you the, the Hawthorne, this is a standard sociology thing. They were doing, uh, scientists were doing a study at the Hawthorne plant of General Electric in Cicero, Illinois. This back in the 1930s. And they wanted to see whether improving the lighting would help get higher performance. And they started, they measured all the outputs, and they got the lighting up, up, and it doubled the productivity in there feeling really great, and all they have to do is say, well, now we're going to reduce it and show it goes back down. They started reducing it, the productivity went higher. 
And they got it all the way back to the worst case at the beginning, and now it's tripled. <laughs> and they're saying, what's going on? And finally, you know what breaking the blind is. Finally, the, the, the head of the experiment grabs this woman and says, I can see you're working very hard. What's going on? And she said, who? Huh? With all these people watching, I'm not going to let my team down. <laughs> In other words, it stands for the proposition that being observed changes the way people act. But with, with people, you know, it's, and of course with religion, you're always dealing with people. Okay, let me finish. I'm very close to the end here. So I mentioned Charles Taylor as somebody that Thomas Kuhn had, uh, you know, considers him on the same level, like probably your son or something. And he explores the topic of spirituality in the modern world in this book called A Secular Age. And what he comes, well, let me go to the next slide. And he poses two choices to the modern world, which corresponds to Wilfred Cantwell Smith's seven attitudes. Remember the five that are pro-spirituality and the two that are anti or skeptical? And he, he says, well, some people would call that the religious or the non or secular or the theist or the non-theist. But he says the key difference is the transcendent or the non-transcendent. In other words, whether you think there's something more, whatever it is, something transcendent, or, and he, his term for the other one is very good, it is uh, exclusively human flourishing. So human flourishing would be the secular alternative. And basically, thinks everything falls into one of those two categories. And uh, I just found it a very interesting way to look at it because I'm always trying to understand these things. So <clears throat> let me just see what I have. OK, I'm going to go back to the seven world, seven attitudes about spirituality, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and then the two that are either anti-spirituality or skeptical Marxism, meaning communism, not democratic socialism, or Western secularism, which has its roots in ancient Greece, but uh, really the French Enlightenment uh, is when it first showed up. And thank you. <laughs> No, I, I know I've got questions coming. I'm a little fuzzy on the transcendence part of this. Yeah. Um, the idiosyncratic behavior of an individual who thinks they transcended, we have to socially accept, or I'm just really fuzzy on it. Well, the way I would state it, especially to this audience, is believing there's something more than just what meets the eye. Which is acceptable for an individual. For the individual, yeah. And uh, remember, I, I've been doing a lot of reading of the National UU website. And what they say is that we believe there is a higher power, right? This is what the website says. Uh, but we also accept atheists. You know, we have anybody who is searching for spirituality, uh, you know, and I would say generally they don't favor any rigid, you know, positions such as uh, the religions. But. Yeah, I, uh, I thought that that was an absolutely beautiful summary of two different points of view about religion. And we can see this battle being fought among Unitarian Universalists, are we humanists? That is, do we put our emphasis on purely human flourishing, or are we seeking more, something transcendent? 
to more than human flourishing. And that seems to be the battle going on in UUism. Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to take sides in this, but I am trying to help other oh, people think of what? <laughs> I said, go ahead. Well, you know what side I'm on. <laughs> but, but, you know, to, to me, this is a, I don't know, I, don't, I hate to call it an intellectual thing, but it's been part of my own search. I was a member of the American Humanist Association. <laughs> 50 years ago, but a uh, card carrying member, you know, so I've been sort of all over the place. And, uh, all right, I don't want to keep you if you don't have. Uh, well, okay. Let's see, nailed it. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Where do you stand?